Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unusual Education. Um, today I will continue talking about um, alternating current and um, certain, um, well, devices or um, certain ele uh, electrical equipment actually installed in the circuit. Now, the devices which we are talking about are resistors, capacitors, and inductors. In the previous lectures, we were talking about only resistors, or resistors and capacitors, or resistors and inductors in the uh, AC circuit. Today, I will combine them together. So, basically, it's kind of a continuation of whatever was before discussed in uh, these lectures. Um, there will be a differential equation, there will be a solution to this equation. Um, I do encourage you to, uh, after you watch this lecture, to read the text um, which is um, accompanying this lecture on the unizor.com. This lecture is part of the course Physics for Teens presented on unizor.com and all the lectures have notes uh, on this website. So if you found it on, on YouTube, for instance, you will see only the lecture itself. Uh, from the website, you can see the lecture and you can read the text, um, which is basically like a textbook. Uh, the website is uh, absolutely free. There are no advertisements. Uh, also, the website contains math for teens, the prerequisite course. You do need math to study physics seriously. Like in this particular case, like today's lecture, uh, we will have differential equation, which you probably have to, you know, at least know what it is. Um, okay. Let's consider we have a circuit which contains um, the source of alternating current. You have a capacitor you have inductor and you have resistor. Inductor has uh, inductance L and capacitor has capacitance C. This is given. What else is given? Well, this is a source of uh, alternating current which is generated by rotating some uh, rotor um, inside the stator and you will have sinusoidal sinusoidal um, electromotive force generated so this is electromotive force voltage generated by this AC uh, generator where Omega is angular velocity or angular speed and um, E0 is a peak EMF, peak voltage generated. So basically it goes from uh, minus E0 to plus E0 in a sinusoidal way. So that's given. What I have to determine is what kind of a current I will have here. That's my problem. So, I will approach this problem in exactly the same fashion I did for RC and RL uh, circuits. RC where resistor and capacitor was, RL was, was when uh, resistor and inductor was. Very similar, the same logic. We will just have a little bit different differential equation as a result which we will solve, etc. Okay, so this is basically is given. I need this space, I will wipe it out. So, now, as the current goes around the circuit, one way and then another way, well, it actually meets certain resistance. On a resistor, resistor, resistance is based on this value of R. On the inductor, the 
resistance is called actually reactness. So it's an inductive reactness. And induct in inductive reactness is measured by Omega times L, where omega is um, the angular speed of voltage, and L is inductance of this inductor. So obviously, the greater um, uh, frequency of oscillations, um, we will have more resistance if my uh, current is not alternating, but the direct current, which means omega is actually is equal to zero. There are no oscillations. The inductor doesn't really present any kind of a resistance. So it's only when you have the variable um, uh, AC, the inductor has variable flux go going through it, and that's what actually is causing the uh, self-induction which works always against the voltage which comes in so that's why we have this type of resistance and finally we will have xc which is um, reactance um, capacitive reactance of the capacitor and uh, in this case it's just the other dependence of the frequency if there is no frequency, uh, the capacitor actually doesn't really let direct current through. And the more frequent oscillations are, the easier it goes through the capacitor. So we were talking about this when we were discussing capacitors and about this when we were discussing inductors. So these are, these resistance, inductive reactants and um, capacitive reactants are the source of resistance to the uh, current. So, combined together, they actually cause the whole circuit to resist um, in some way the voltage which is basically running the electrons through this circuit. So, we really have to find out how exactly it happens. Now, what happens around each element which we have, and we have a resistor, we have an inductor, and we have a capacitor. So around each, we can measure the voltage on both ends. So the difference between the voltage on one end and another end is basically, we call it voltage drop, and we can definitely localize um, all the electric um, uh, all the electric behavior of this particular item only using these local um, voltage drops. Now, for instance, if you have a resistor, then the current which goes through this and a voltage drop around it are related to each other through the Ohm's law. It doesn't really matter that these are dependent on time. At any given time, we can consider that during a small interval of time, they have the current which is basically constant during the infinitesimal time period. The current doesn't really change. And the Ohm's law is supposed to be working. So basically we can say that in this particular case, uh, dr of t is equal to r times i of t. Right? This is basically the Ohm's law for resistor. Good. Now let's talk about inductor. Now the inductor uh, inductor uh, has certain um, quality of resisting uh, through the self-induction, resisting the current. Now, how is actually, how is actually happening? So if you have an inductor, now, 
this is voltage drop on the inductor, right? So what happens with inductor? The resistance, this voltage drop is actually the result, result of resistance, right? So it's a self-induction. We were talking about uh, mechanism of self-induction, why it happens, etc. What, what does it depend on? Well, it depends actually on the rate of change of the electrical electromagnetic flux which goes through this inductor. So there is a concept of electromagnetic flux and rate of change actually is causing the self-induction and self-induction is whatever actually the voltage drops from one end to another. So the, uh, the, the, the voltage drop depends basically on the rate of the changing of the electromagnetic flux. Again, if you forgot about what electromagnetic flux is, go to one of the previous lectures. Now, electromagnetic flux, in turn, depends on the current which goes through this and certain uh, electromagnetic characteristics which are embedded in the inductance uh, L known to us. So we are assuming that it's known. Now, how is it actually dependent? Very simply. The, the flux is actually proportional to uh, current and it's proportional to whatever the inductance actually is. This is the definition of the inductance, if you wish. So we can always say, instead of uh, this we can put that uh, this is equal to L times di t per dt. So let me write it here that my VL of t is equal to L times i. I will use the little slash and that's all about drop of the voltage around the inductor. <coughs> now let's talk about capacitor. Again, we have certain voltage drop here. Now, when we were talking about capacitors, we were saying something like this, that if you have certain amount of electricity accumulated on the plates and the voltage on both ends. Their ratio is constant and this is basically a capacitance of the capacitor. So the more voltage you apply, the more electricity is concentrated on the plates of this capacitor. And that's kind of obvious. And how much more, it all depends on, on the capaci capacitance. For instance, bigger plates can accumulate more uh, electricity uh, on its plates than smaller plates. Uh, smaller distance between the plates also contributes to a greater capacity, capacitance. But whatever capacitance is, the amount of electricity accumulated on the plates is always uh, divided by the voltage. Vo voltage drop in both ends is always a constant and that's the constant which defines the, the capacitor. <coughs> now, there is a very interesting uh, thing here. How this uh, amount of electricity accumulated in the plates relate to uh, current in, in the whole circuit? Well, very simply. What is the current? Current is rate of change of the amount of electricity, right? So if you have two plates and there is certain accumulated uh, charge on these plates, if we will take the derivative by time, we will have actually the current which goes around it. So what I would like to say here that the VL, uh, no, not VL, VC. 
the voltage drop around the, uh, around the capacitor is equal to Q C divided by C and Q is my IFT. This is basically all we need from the physics. Now we start mathematics. Uh, I didn't mention it before, but I kind of assume it's obvious that I of t, this is the current which goes in the whole uh, circuit. It's the same. This current is the same for a, uh, for a, a capacitor, for um, inductor, and for um, resistance. Um, now, it's the same circuit. So the same electrons are going around. So whatever goes through my uh, resistor, it's exactly the same amount of electricity, uh, the same uh, amount of electricity per unit of time, if you wish, which goes through the inductor, and exactly the same which is goes through a uh, capacitor. So that's why this IT and this IT and this IT, they're all the same I of T. This is the same amount of current uh, as a function of time. Now, um, what now happens here is var one very simple equation. And the equation actually is, if you have a closed circuit and you have an EMF generated by a source of electricity, and then you have one, two, three different drops, voltage drops on a resistor, on a inductor, and a capacitor, then obviously the generated amount of electricity, the voltage basically generated, is sum of these three voltage drops. This is our equation which will allow us to determine the value of current in the, um, in the circuit. So this is actually um, a differential equation. So let me right now switch to pure mathematics in this particular case. What's a little bit unfortunate is, you see, this is a charge. Q is a charge. And these are um, uh, the currents. I of T is a current. Q of T is a charge. But they are related. So what I will do, I will I um, express everything in terms of Q. So I will have um, VR of T is equal to R times I of T, which is first uh, derivative of C. VL of T is equal to uh, L times uh, first derivative of i is a second derivative of q, right? So it's a q second derivative c of t. And finally, vc of t is equal to qc of t divided by c. Now, everything is expressed in terms of q. q first derivative of q and the second derivative of q. And we can substitute it into this equation. We know the expression for e of t. So it's E0 times sine of omega t. And it's equal to. Now, let me just make it a little bit shorter. I will use y of t instead of qc of t. Just easier to, to write. So what happens is, some of these three, well, let me start from the highest derivative. So it's L times second derivative of R. Now the first derivative is R and uh, the plain one without any derivative is this one. Okay, as you see we have very normal, I would say, linear differential equation and this sum is equal to some trigonometric function. 
Now, all the details how to solve this equation are actually presented in the uh, text for this lecture, in the notes for this lecture. So you have to go to this website, you have to choose um, the, the part which is called electromagnetism, then you should find uh, the uh, alternating current on the next screen, and this is one of the lectures related to the Ohm's law for AC. Now, and this is the name of the lecture, actually, RLC circuits and Ohm's law. Um, now, what I would like to basically explain right now how people solve these, this type of equation with as less, uh, as small amount of details, actually. So how can we solve this equation? Now, I'm not talking about any kind of a general approach to solve equations. This is a very particular one. You see, this is a trigonometric function. And what actually people do, they solving trigonometric equations, in so sometimes it's an art, it's not a, a skill. Now, as far as the art is concerned, well, basically it depends on experience, etc., etc., and people have done it many times before, they see that if there is a trigonometric function on the left of this, uh, and this is just a uh, linear equation, then it's convenient and most likely it will bring some good results if we will use this form of potential solution to this equation. Well, let me see. Can I find f and g such that this particular function will satisfy this equation? Again, based on experience, intuition, whatever it is. Um, so, that's exactly what um, we're going to do. We will try to find f and g to satisfy this. Is it possible? Well, yes it is, actually, because you know that Derivative of sine is a cosine. Derivative of cosine is a sine. So we are not actually going out from the sine cosine if we will start differentiating functions. So this is this has sine and cosine, this has sine and cosine, this has sine and cosine, with different coefficients, obviously. And this is sine. So we can basically combine this into one equation and equate all the sines and all the cosines to whatever is necessary, separately. And that's how we will get two equations with two variables. Okay, very, f very quickly. The first derivative is, um, it's uh, omega f cosine omega t minus, uh, derivative of cosine is a minus sign, and there is an inner function, so it's omega g cosine omega t, uh, sine, sorry, sine. Now the second derivative would be from cosine is a minus sine and another omega, so it's minus omega square f sine of omega t uh, from sine is a cosine minus still minus omega square g cosine omega t. Incidentally, this is equal to minus omega square times y of t. You see, if I will take a minus omega square factor out, I will have f sine plus g cosine, exactly the same as this one. So it's easier because right now if I will substitute all of these into this equation, uh, I will not even have the second derivative, I will have basically only one particular equation, and what happens is, what are my uh, um, what are my coefficients actually uh, separately for sine and cosine? Well, let's see. On the left, I have only sine, so for the sine, I have only e zero. On the right, I have l times the, f the second derivative, and sine is equal this. 
so it's minus omega square L F now from this I have R times this so it's plus R omega F uh, no sorry we need sine so it's not this so it's minus um, omega R G and from this I have F again uh, with 1 over C plus 1 over C times F okay this is equation for F and G I just added this expression L multiplied by this R multiplied by this and 1 over C multiplied by this and added them together and took only sine sine and sine and this is sine on the left now what about cosine cosine on the, on the left is equal to zero right now on the right what do I have with the cosine I have L times the second derivative which is minus L omega square cosine then I have plus R this so it's plus R plus omega R uh, uh, I forgot G by the way here right yes I forgot G minus L G omega square uh, omega R F from this and the cosine from this is G times 1 over C uh, G right so we have system of two equations with two variables F and G it's a linear system which is we know how to solve system of two linear equations with two variables and I will just write the result again all the <coughs> details you can find in the notes for this lecture but I will just write down the result <coughs> so um, y of t is equal to f sine omega t plus g cosine omega t where f is equal to e0 divided by omega xc minus xl divided by z square g is equal to minus e0 divided by omega times r divided by z square now what is this well first of all my coefficients were l and c and r right so instead of l I'll, i used x l divided by omega instead of c i was using uh what what, what was using uh omega um, yes uh one over x c uh, uh one over x c omega so i use these and i have basically um simplified all these formulas and the z square is equal to x c minus x l square plus r square so i skip all this arithmetic and this is basically the result of solving that system of two equations with two variables this is easy but tedious unfortunately um, and this is the result so i have my answer i have the a solution to differential equation and this y of t which is actually uh, amount of charge accumulated on the plates of uh, capacitor and the um, derivative of this is equal to current which i actually need before going into derivative let me just mention something here um, you see what's interesting here is xc minus xl r and z square is equal to this now what it means is that xc minus 
xl divided by z and r divided by z are two things which are which has which have the following property well first of all the absolute value of this and absolute value of this is between 0 and 1 right it because you know because of this so xc minus xl square is less than this so uh, the absolute value is from 0 to 1 same thing here uh, and sum of their squares is equal to z square in this case sum of these squares is equal to 1 right square of this plus square of this is equal to 1 now as you understand we can always find an angle phi which has the following property and cosine of phi is equal to r over z and tangent by the way of phi is equal to x mi c minus minus xl divided by r so we can always find angle if we have these two values sum of their squares is equal to one each one of them is uh, by absolute value from zero to one then we can find the angle basically the angle phi is arc sine of this and um, the same thing as arc cosine of this or arc tan or arc tangent of this so if we will just take this particular angle we will get this situation why did i do it here is why because now instead of f i can use e0 divided by omega z times <coughs> times this so one of z goes here and another z i will use replacement for sine sine phi and this one is equal to minus e0 divided by omega z r times z is cosine phi and what do i have as a result As a result, my y of t is equal to um, e0 divided by omega um, z times what? <coughs> sine times sine, right? Sine omega t times sine phi minus cosine omega t cosine phi, correct? And what is this? This is minus cosine. No, this, yeah, minus cosine of omega t plus phi. So my whole formula actually is much easier to express in this particular fashion. Y of t is equal to e0 divided by um, omega z uh, minus minus cosine of omega t plus phi now what do I have to do next yt is charge I need to take the first derivative to get the current first derivative of this is what minus cosine <coughs> sorry would be derivative is a sine inner function omega goes out uh, cancels with this one and my i of t is equal to e0 divided by z times sine of omega t plus phi this is my final final formula where z is basically z is square root of this okay that's it basically we have come up with the solution this is my 
uh, current, you see that the current is also sinusoidal as EMF, as I I I initial voltage generated. Um, it has exactly the same uh, frequency of oscillation, angular speed, therefore uh, frequency. By the way, omega is equal to 2 pi f, where f is a frequency, right? You know that. Um, okay. Now, this thing has a special name. Z is called impedance of the circuit. And actually, this impeden imp impedance plays exactly the same role as resistance. You see, the formula is very much like peak I0, uh, peak of I is, well, I0, you can say that I is equal to I0, the peak value, times sine of omega t plus phi, and I0 is equal to E0 divided by Z. This looks like the Ohm's law. This is the voltage, this is the current, and Z is measured in exactly the same ohms as resistance. You see? Xc, Xl, R, this is all ohms square, and Z is the square root of this, so Z is also measured in ohms. So this is actually an equivalent of AC, um, in AC equivalent of the ohms law. Now from this obviously follows that the same thing for effective voltage and effective uh, current. Because effective is less than peak by square root of 2, as we know. So, what else is important here? Well, basically, um, if you will take a look at this formula, it corresponds to whatever we were um, talking before about RL and RC circuits, because RL circuit is when your xc is equal to zero. So you will have square root of xl square plus r square, which is exactly what we have derived with in the previous lecture. Same thing, if my xl is equal to zero, we will have xc square plus r square, which is also corresponding to the one of the previous lectures where we were talking about rc circuit. So basically, this is just a more general formula where all three components are involved, resistor, inductor, and capacitor, and um, it gives you basically the picture of how the oscillation of the electric current actually is. It's exactly the same uh, uh, frequency of oscillations, but it's shifted, so there is a phase shift. And what's interesting is that this phase shift, phi, that's what we were talking about, phi is equal to tangent phi, is equal to xc minus xl divided by r. Well, what it means is it's positive or negative depending on how my reactances are related. If my um, capacitor's reactance is greater, then the phase shift would be positive. Uh, this would be positive. If my um, inductive uh, reactance is greater than um, capacitive, capacitive uh, reactance, it will be negative, so it will be shifted to another side. And if they are equal to each other, which happens, this is a resonance uh, kind of situation, when there is no shift, when the phi would, would be equal to zero. You see, if they are equal to, to each other, tangent is zero, so angle is zero, and my um, current would be um, uh, not will not be shifted in phase relative to the uh, generated voltage. Well, that's it. I do recommend you to read um, all the notes for this lecture. There are much more detailed um, uh, solution, which I, I just jumped to a solution, but in, in theory there are some more details and more formulas if you are interested. Other than that, that's it. Good luck. Thank you very much.